If you have an Old Testament handy, turn with me to Psalm 19. We're going to look at at Psalm 19 as the text for our, our lesson this morning. How do we know about God? Psalm 19 underscores the two quadrants, the two sections, if you will, two ends of the spectrum about how we know about God. It combines these two elements, the skies and the scriptures. That's one way of describing them. God's world and God's word. Or God's natural revelation, his revelation generally in nature all around us. And God's written revelation in scripture. So in these two realms, we're able to gather information about God. We're able to to come to terms with the kind of being that he is. And we're able to learn more about ourselves in the place of, of, of God's world all around us. And Psalm 19, again, underscores these, these two ideas. Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, put his finger on, on these ideas when he said, two things fill the, the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The starry heavens above and the moral law within. C.S. Lewis, when he was thinking about Psalm 19, the great uh, British playwright and philosopher, he said, I, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. And so you have God's revelation in nature, you have God's revelation in Scripture, and Psalm 19 breaks those down. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes, through, goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. This is poetry. It's poetic. It's not intended to be scientific in, in language, but nonetheless, the psalmist puts his finger on God's revelation in nature, and the first thing that he says, essentially, is that the heavens speak to us. When we look at the intricate design and orderliness of nature, the cause and effect relationships of all that is there, it speaks to us, the heavens speak to us, like a forensic scientist who looks at the clues and draws firm conclusions from the evidence at the crime scene. God is seen everywhere. Everywhere we look, we see God. That doesn't mean that you pick up a rock, a talking rock, and all of a sudden the rock says to you, God made me. But nonetheless, you pick up a, gla a blade of grass, it speaks to you. You look, you look at the heavens on a starry night, they speak to you. You look at your own body and you say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, like David did in Psalm 139. God speaks to us everywhere, even if the communication is nonverbal. Though voiceless, the communication is nonetheless there. The sun is a brilliant example. Again, this is poetry upon poetry. Like a bridegroom who can't wait to get married, and he's got a tent, and he just bursts out with excitement because of the wedding. The sun is hidden, 
we can't see it for half the day at nighttime. And then all of a sudden on the skyline, it bursts in the eastern sky and then continues along its circuits to the western sky in the evening at sunset. And again, this is not scientific as much as it is poetic, but there is a fundamental truth underscored in this, that everywhere we look in the universe, we see the evidence of God and the orderliness of the design, and even the planets revolving around the sun, the star that is at the core of our, our universe. It gives warmth, it gives light, the uh, earth rotates on its axis and the sun comes up at least apparently, and goes down, apparently it's the earth that's moving. But it's the same sun that is a major factor in photosynthesis. It spurs the production of vitamin D that helps protect us from disease. There, it, there are thousands of things that we could talk about that, that the sun does in this miracle we call life. And behind it all is the greatness of God, mind-boggling as it is. But we look at those cause and effect relationships. We look at the designer behind the design and the ultimate first cause behind all of the effects. And we see God. In Acts, the 14th chapter, you have the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Paul and Barnabas are preaching. And in Acts 14, beginning with verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, that is, idolaters who wanted to give glory to them as if they were gods, they tore their garments, rushed out into the crowd, crying, men, we are doing these things, or why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you and bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. I want you to underscore that phrase. He did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness everywhere you look, even in the seasons, in the harvest and the cycles of, of nature. You see the hand of God and the goodness of God invested in all the production that results from that and the good that results from it. As Donald Williams has said, like an artist, God signs his work. You have the signature of God everywhere you look in nature. And I think... Everybody in his or her better moments has these little flashes. I did a sermon maybe six years ago that I called homing signals. Winston Churchill once said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. But uh, sociologist Peter Berger calls them signals of transcendence. Um, we can call them a scene shifter or a disruptive catalyst or a homing signal or um, a beeping signal, a clue, a jolt, a trigger, an epiphany. When um, the Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus and he, he sees the Lord in the, in the bright light, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? How difficult it is for you to kick against the goads. You ever run up against an ox goad, sharp instrument? Those goads were tugging at Paul's heart. All along, he had little moments in which he could have put all the evidence together and seen the obvious, but out of sight, out of mind, denial of the obvious, suppression of truth. And I think that's what human beings generally do. We have the evidence staring at us wherever we look, and, and it's obvious when we, when we put the, the, the factors of the equation together, but we don't want to see it necessarily. 
but there are little moments when even the staunchest atheist has an opportunity to have a sudden realization or a, a flash of, of atheism's logical conclusions or a glimpse of all that is good in the world and the source behind it or a realization of, of, of such a thing as, as evil. Whatever the jolt may be, it may even come as one is, is dreaming in the night. Elihu mentions to Job in Job 33, 14 to 16, for God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings. Whatever the jolt may be, it's a signpost that points a person beyond this life to eternity and to see that, that the supernatural is more than just this natural world that, that we might think. It's like a Soviet es essayist wrote in what was very much an atheistic society in the 20th century. He said, in the 20th century, there's no doubt for every reasonable person that a supreme reason exists in the world, in the universe, in life. A denial would mean that such complicated organisms as a flower, a bird, a human being, and finally a human brain appeared at random, the result of a lucky, blind, and unprogrammed combination of chemical elements. The question, he says, is not whether a supreme reason exists, but whether it knows about me and has anything to do with me. We have plenty of reason for believing that, that God exists. Dr. Andrew Conway Ivey made the observation that as long as children are being born into this world, faith in God could never be ultimately destroyed because so compelling is the natural law of the relation of cause and effect that the developing mind of the three to five year old child realizes that there must be a creator. I agree with that. And I believe that we, in our supposed sophistication, want to join the, the chorus of, of people who are in denial about God. Freud said that belief in God is the projection of a wish. No, it's just the other way around. The real wishful thinking goes on in the mind of unbelievers who want to put God out of sight, out of mind, and pretend that he doesn't exist when in reality he does. And his evidence is all around. His fingerprints are everywhere. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. When the sun comes out, we have evidence of God. When we look around us in nature, we have evidence of God. When we look deep down inside of ourselves, we have evidence of God. God speaks to us in nature, even if it's nonverbal communication. But the beauty of all of this is God has revealed himself in verbal communication. He's not only revealed himself generally in nature, he has specifically revealed himself in scripture. So you have a, a continuation in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the droppings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. We live in a, a world that is increasingly biblically illiterate. As one believer bemoaned, the word of God is no longer, it no longer provides the mental furniture of our lives. That's generally true, but it ought not to be true of believers. We ought to define our, our lives through scripture Jesus prayed, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So as we're sanctified to be in the world but not of the world, the, the one defining characteristic is that we define our lives by the principles and the promises of this book. 
And we see things that unbelievers don't see, therefore, through God's eyes and God's principles. And when we, when we look at the Word of God in that light, a God who not only reveals himself generally in nature, but specifically in Scripture, and we look at what the Word of God really is to us, its law, its testimony, precepts, commandments, fear, judgments, and we look at how we esteem it in that light as perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Fear of the Lord is clean. The judgments of the Lord are righteous. And so on. Not only how we esteem it, but but what it actually does in a practical way. What does the Word of God do for us? How does it fundamentally change us? It revives the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. It displays righteousness. It fundamentally changes us. There are transformational things going on when the Word of God is internalized, taken to heart. We fundamentally change who we are as people. And the end result of that process is that in functional value, we esteem the principles of this book as more desirable than gold, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey. By them, your servant is warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. Do we value the, the Word of God to that extent, that, that, that it is the, 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 the defining instrument of our lives to help us see through the fog? Many other passages address this issue. The idea of, of using the truth of God as a defense for our faith in a world that, that does not know God. Sanctify in your hearts Christ Jesus as Lord and be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is within you, yet with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15 said. Give diligence or, or do your best. To be a, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, a workman of God, no need to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do we really believe these principles? Do, do we value this book being a, a, worth its weight in gold, sweeter than, than, than honey? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Paul says in Romans 1.16. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2, God says through the prophet Isaiah, But to this one will I look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. There's built in holy respect for, for God's word. Or a psalm that is in so many ways parallel, but even much longer than Psalm 19. In touching these same principles, Psalm 119, they're easy to remember. One is Psalm 19, the other 119. My favorite section of Psalm 119 is verses 97 through 105. It, it's the heart of the psalm, as far as I'm concerned, and a rhapsody on, on a total appreciation for God's word. And... Um, and I'll just throw this one in for free. Um, every paragraph of Psalm 119 starts with a, a different letter of the Hebrew Aleph Beit. 
the Hebrew alphabet. And every line of this section, at least verses 97 to 104, starts with the Hebrew letter Mem, which corresponds with the English letter M. Um, I really like this paragraph <laughs> for multiple reasons. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your lamp, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I like to say God's word is our night vision goggles so that we can see clearly in the night of this dark world of sin. So we have God's world and God's word. And then finally, in Psalm 119, or Psalm 19, rather, we have our humble response to these things in, in, in verses 12 through 14. Psalm 19, 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And here's what we see in, in the very last section, a, a burning desire for righteousness. It's almost like the beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Burning desire for righteousness. Along with a recognition of this, this world of, of sin. And um, you look around at, at the world, you see God everywhere, and all you need to do is look at a mirror, and you see evidence of criminality against that same God. Because that's what this last paragraph does, is it forces some honesty. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. First John 1, verse 8. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we see the brokenness of humanity here. And hearts that, that need to be repaired. According to Reinhold Niebuhr, we forget the biased self-interest and moral defect at the heart of all human thinking. So that we may appear nobler and more generous than we really are. He says, everyone wears a mask and it lies. That's something to chew on. The prophet Micah says that leaders twist everything that is straight. Micah 3, verse 9. Philosopher Ziad Marar said, Our hearts can't, cannot stop pumping blood, so our minds cannot stop pumping illusions. The Swedish playwright August Strindberg said, I have looked for God and found the devil. The highest achievement, he said, the highest human achievement is only the concealment of our vileness. Now, you may think that we ought to have a higher view of human beings than that. And ultimately, we ought to. At least in, in principle, in terms of, of, of what we're capable of on the good side of the scale. But in truth, if we live in denial of, of the evil that really exists in the world and the evil that really has bombarded our own lives and our own hearts, then maybe Psalm 19, 12 through 14 would not make a whole lot of sense. But you have this burning desire for righteousness, and in verse 12, you have this prayer for forgiveness. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. That's, that's forgiveness. Declare me innocent. 
the fact that he's committed hidden faults, faults that may be hidden from himself. And he realizes that he needs to be forgiven of those things. And then he prays not only for forgiveness, but for guidance so that he would not commit presumptuous, high-handed sins. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion of me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And then you have a prayer for acceptance in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When I think about this last paragraph, I was reading 1 John this last week and, and contemplating the Apostle John and some of the things he says in, in 1 John and, and the need for protective care that we have. Here you have a prayer for, for protective guidance in a world that is full of evil. Keep my heart from, from all of these dangers that are lurking, lurking everywhere. So that in the end, my, the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And, and as I was reading 1 John, I, I came across this passage at the very end of the book. And it hit me in a way that it never has before. And I've been at this for a little while, folks. I mean, I, I read the Bible just a few times. And when I see a passage, it hits me in a new way. And I, and I often do that. Uh, it doesn't matter how many gazillions of times you, you read the text, there's always new treasure to be found. But 1 John 5, 18 and 19 says this, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin. And that's usually translated, does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. I want you to meditate on that one for a good long while. We need to get to a point where our prayer life is such and God's intervention is such that uh, sin does not become the operative principle of our lives any longer. That doesn't mean that we're not going to ever commit a sin, but it, what it does mean, it, it, it no longer is the predominant landscape of our hearts. And that we depend upon God, we depend upon the Lord Jesus, the one who is born of God, to protect us so that the evil one no longer touches us. And I believe the psalmist is essentially praying that prayer in, in Psalm 19. We know that we are from God, verse 19 says, 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But even here in Psalm 19, you have this burning desire for righteousness, prayer for forgiveness, prayer for guidance, prayer for acceptance. Okay, so the younger preachers and I, get together every day and uh, we have special classes at certain junctures of the week and we have shop talks on Monday and Friday, but we get together every day and we talk principles from God's word and we talk about preaching and outlining and, and, and uh, we have a Greek lesson every day. And, and so I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday of last week and I, I was giving them a lesson on, on outlining and I said, when you're analyzing a text or when you're analyzing an argument or when you're analyzing how to, how to articulate the truth of God, always start with the wide angle lens, I said. Always look at the big picture, the big broad panorama. And then dial in, zoom in from the big picture in the zoom lens view to some of the details. And then as you're analyzing those details, never fail to zoom back out from time to time and look at the big picture again. 
you zoom in, you zoom out, but start with the big picture and, and then zoom in. And did you realize that that's exactly what this psalmist does with this psalm? You have the broad panorama, the wide angle lens. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And then you zoom in a little bit. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving my soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You've zoomed in from the world to the word. And then at the end of the psalm, you zoom in some more. And you know where you zoom in then? You zoom in to the heart. Who can discern his errors? Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We go from the creation and the world of God to the word of God and the God who loves us and shares with us his plan, his transforming message. And then we zoom in some more and we get to the, the human heart beset with struggle, broken in need of being fixed, in danger, in need of being protected. And here's the thought that is humbling. The God who created this world has revealed this word. And the end result of all of that is the repairing of this heart and your heart. Why does this world exist? Why does this word exist? It's to fix what is broken in you and to protect you so that God can take you home forever and ever and ever to enjoy his heaven with him. If you read Psalm 19 in that light, you might come to the conclusion, as C.S. Lewis does, this is the greatest piece of poetry there is out there. Truly transforming. And if you've been listening, you're with me, and you're not a Christian, I want you to think about that very heavily as we sing a song that will encourage your heart to respond to God and his gospel. Let's do that right now as we get together, stand and sing.